Welcome to the Aotearoa Rugby Pod, the final ep for this year. We come back again next year. But why not finish the year this time around with a bit of chat about the laws and how the game's going, and we can do that with no better person than Ben O'Keefe, New Zealand rugby referee, of course, James Parsons, with us as usual. Ben, let's start. You've got a New Zealand you know, silver fern on your chest there, and you got to referee the All Blacks. Like, that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen, a Kiwi refereeing the All Blacks. Yeah. What yeah. was that like? Oh, it, was, it was pretty amazing. I've had to dust this off now because I can finally wear it again. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it was just, you know, it's been a weird year and, and out of weird, weird years that we've had, we've, you know, had an opportunity where, you know, we had to have, you know, non-neutral referees referee um, international test matches. Uh, it was interesting because I think like not a lot of people realise that you actually can't referee your own nation. Mm. So, you know, I've gone through refereeing Super Rugby and, um, you know, you can referee, you know, teams in New Zealand, but, you know, as soon as you referee test matches, you can't referee the All Blacks. So, um, yeah, this year in, in Australia, I got to um, referee the All Blacks versus the Wallabies at, at ANZ Stadium and it was... Yeah, it was pretty, pretty incredible. How do you approach that? Obviously, you know, you've always got eyes on you as a referee and there's everyone wanting to be critical of you, but, you know, you could be accused of nepotism <laughs> pretty easily as a, a Kiwi referee in the All Blacks. What was your mindset to approaching, you know, that kind of thing where Aussies are going to look at you like, oh, it's a Kiwi ref making that decision? Yeah, like I think with ref refereeing, it's, it's sort of lose-lose anyway. So, you know, you add <laughs> refereeing your own country on top of that as well. I mean, there's always going to be, you know, outcomes of a game that people are going to question. Um, it was interesting because like the, the main thing between the referee, we had, we had four referees that were going to referee their own country. So myself, Paul Williams, Angus Gardner and Nick Berry from Australia. So we we're in a series where, look, we're going to have to you know, have those talks and discussions. So we, yeah, we had to have the new, we had to sit down and actually plan, okay, how are we going to, how are we going to do this? How are we going to referee our, our nation? Um, but also how are we going to you know, deal with you know, everything that happens afterwards? Um, so a lot of it was just around, look, it is just another game of rugby. You know, test matches happen so quickly. That actually you can't, you know, there's, you're referring what's in front of you. Um, so it's very easy, uh, you know, not to get caught up in, you know, who is, who's actually, you know, at that tackle, who you're actually penalising. So it was really like the emotion before the game, you know, hearing the national anthem, seeing the haka. Normally we're overseas, you know, I'm normally referring in South Africa, watching the All Blacks because we're about to do a test series with South Africa France or, you know, South Africa Wallabies. So, you know, all that emotional stuff beforehand was quite interesting. You know, that's something we talked about. And um, fortunately I was the third game in a row so you know uh, we already had the first game that was done in Wellington second game that was done in um, Eden Park so I've sort of already gone through that experience and then when I got out there in ANZ Stadium to do my game um, it was a lot of, I think it was a lot easier in terms of you know just those um, those peripheral things um, because as, as soon as we blew the whistle you know we're just we're just straight into the game and you know, it happened so quickly that you know it was, it was it was hard not to you know realize who was actually you know you're referring. Was it shaped that way to make you the third test so that I suppose it wasn't as a foreign environment rather than say the first test you just put out there straight away? Yeah, well I mean like Paul had to do the first test, New Zealand, New Zealand referee, so I think you know that was that was difficult for all of us because there was a lot of just unknown. You know, yeah. we, we, we know how to build up for a test match, we know how to referee a test match really well, um, but that unknown part was actually you're doing it in, in Wellington, you know, where I live actually. Yeah. Um, so I've never actually, you know, got my gear out in Wellington to be able to do that, I've always been overseas, so all of that kind of stuff was new. Um, so there was a lot of things that was, you know, we tried to, you know, put things in place to, to help us in that environment. But until you actually get out there and do it, like we just didn't know. Yeah. So it was easier, you know, by the by the time that I had to do my game. The game sure. itself, the test match you refed, obviously a few challenging decisions, obviously with the yellow cards yeah. and, and and the air. Was that was that hard? You know, like you know, they're quite big decisions, and and they were both really early in the game. Yeah. Was that a challenging, you know, sort of time for you? Yeah, like reflecting on that, it was yeah. because, you know, normally you tell yourself, okay, I'm going to get ready to make a. If I have to make a big decision off the, the first whistle, I've got to do that. You yeah. know? And sometimes you can't afford to, you know, take five minutes to get into a game, just like mm. a play. You know, yeah, you've yeah. got to you got to get in there for the, you know, off the first kickoff. So I think there was a, a collision in the year, like with two minute, two minutes in, yeah. and I remember just like rolling my eyes, being like, okay, here we go. This is pretty typical, you know. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, we've got to step up to this. And um, I think that's why you work on processes, you know, you just get into your, your process around foul play and, you know, the, the, the structure that you go through, just like any other game, and, uh, you know, made me, you know, make the right decision, um, whether you're wearing a Wallabies jersey or, a, or an All Blacks jersey. And so we were able to get through that game by doing that, because mm. I think another two minutes later we had another um, yellow card, throat, yeah. and then we had um, a try decision uh, yeah. for Dane Coles, mm. and then um, there's a Shannon Frizzell yellow card at the end of the game, so... Yeah, you know, it, it was. It was. It was a proper test match, but it was just the way that things go. You know, you just got to get out there. You got to referee what's in front of you, um, 
and it doesn't really matter what, what jersey they're wearing. Mm. Um, but it was, it was funny, so at the end of the game, I think Geordie Barrett went through and he scored that try like from 50 metres out, you know, it was, yeah. it was a pretty awesome try. And we, we maybe had about three minutes to go and, and Brad Weber um, was, the, <laughs> was, the, was the water boy. Yeah. And so we're like lining up the conversion and he sort of offered me a drink and he was like, um, I've been like, how's that referring to All Blacks? This is pretty cool. Yeah. And like, I, I really wanted to go to him, mate, like this is awesome, you know, yeah. like how good, you know, and you know, there's two minutes to go and, you know, can I, can I have your jersey, you know, like a swap. <laughs> don't give him the five. No, <laughs> don't give him the no, no, because I've already got in trouble with that before, but um, I have to realise, you know, I'm wearing a microphone and, you know, there are perceptions that yeah, you to be aware of, so yeah. you know, that's something we had discussed as a team beforehand uh, with the referees, you know, just got to, you know, be that, be that referee for the whole 80 minutes. And I remember my answer to him was like, you know, mate, it's just like any other game. Yeah, yeah. You know, gave him a bit of a wink and then, then moved on. But um, it was a great experience. Like, I don't know if it will ever happen again. Um, really? Uh, well, it just depends, you know. Like they quite were... successful, though, when you guys, you know, and, you know, you talk about sort of travel costs and stuff and then you guys were as that group. Like, it just seemed like we can move past that, yeah. um, you know, that neutral mindset because it worked well, in, in my opinion. Yeah, I think, you know, we went through a series, but you had a lot of tough decisions. Um, but we were able to work together as, as one sole group for that whole time. And I think that definitely had, a, had, a, had an impact on the game. You know, we were able to actually try and, you know, review the decisions and work well for the next game too. So, look, I, I feel like we have shown that it is, it is successful. Um, and I guess, you know, in the future, if things like that happen again, at least we've got that option now. Um, for, for World Rugby if they want to make that decision. Because I think it, from a player's point of view, because of that consistency of their group, you guys knew each other's strengths and weaknesses and, and the, I suppose the sharpness of decisions and standards from week to week were just so consistent that there was no room or grey area to push the boundary. You knew what was coming and, and you either you know worked towards that or not. Yeah. And I, I don't know if you guys felt that, but from a viewing point of view, it certainly looked like the four of you were extremely sharp on, on and knowing each other's strengths, but also helping out where they're not as strong with the main guy in the middle. Yeah, look, we, we all learned a hell of a lot, you know, over, you know, we were we were together for five, six weeks. Um, and so normally what happens in a test match is like, if I'm referring on a Saturday, um, I might be up in Europe and I'll get a, a, a French assistant referee to fly on on the Friday. Um, then an English referee, you know, system referee to fly on and then the, the Saturday morning as well, you know, so you, you, you meet each other really late, mm. you do the game, then after the game you head home again. So, yeah, it was really unique that we actually got to spend five weeks together. It was like a mini World Cup campaign. Mm. And you're right, so the, the four guys um, that we had, you know, we, we rotated referee, assistant referee and TMO, like that was new, you know, being mm. the TMO, TMO box for the first time. So we rotated that and you're right, so we were able to review together, we were able to preview the game together. And it did mean that you know we were able to you know challenge each other each other on on decisions that we made, talk about philosophies, and I think you know game by game by game you saw that teamwork strengthen. Mm. And there was a lot of behind the scenes chat around okay how can we get better? Why do we miss that offside? How can we get better at that? And we could actually tweak that stuff um, between each games rather than you know having to fly back home and then go back to the southern hemisphere and being in different different time yeah. zones. So the fact that we were able to do that like a team, mm. you know, a mini team of five five referees. Um, I think it really helped, you know. So I, I definitely, I know we all learnt a lot, you know, Paul, Nick, Angus and I over the last, um, over the last sort of six, seven weeks. Um, not just refereeing your own country, mm. but actually the game of rugby and how to referee, it was, it was really good. On a personal level, does it make you a little bit happier, you know, being part of a group rather than being a guy who's jumping here, then jumping there and jumping there and kind of doing your own thing week by week? Yeah, for sure. You know, like, um, I think trust is a big thing. Sure. Um, when you go into a test match, you know, there could be 60,000 people there and, you know, you just want to, you're out in the middle. And yeah, for years, it's been a pretty lonely environment. You've got, you know, captains yelling at you, you've got players yelling at you. No. So, <laughs> <laughs> when you, so when you've got, like, guys that you trust on the sideline giving you advice, you know, the game does happen so quickly now that, um, yeah, you can't see everything. So when you've got the boys telling you, look, mate, you've, you know, that was a knock-on or that was an offside, it really helps the game, you know. So hopefully then people just don't even notice you because, mm. you know, you've actually got all the decisions correct. You can't do that with you know, by yourself. You need the four guys involved. So then are you guys writing a letter to World Rugby, to New Zealand <laughs> Rugby? Like, what's the next step in trying to make this happen if it's so much better than it used to be? Well, um, look, I think, you know, the, the way that we did it um, over uh, the Tri-Nation series, you know, we, we have reviewers with World Rugby after every game. And, you know, part of their constant feedback was guys like, this is going good. You know, there's mm. still things that we need to work on, and yet we, we put a hand up to that for sure. Um, but I think, as I see, you know, we've, we've, created, we've, we've created a blueprint. I've seen that and they saw the success of that. And I think when they go away and, you know, look at obviously travel and, you know, how they're going to do games, um, you know, they, they can see that, look, that is something we can do in the future. But like anything, it comes down to money, comes down to logistics. You know, it's a big, um, it's a global competition. You know, once we get back to normality um, around trying to get, you know, the, the best referees involved in the top game. So 
we'll just have to see, you know. Um, but if they offer us to do that again, then yeah, 100% I'd be pretty keen. it has been a bit of a major for you this year. Um, you guys are so used to travelling and being away from home so often. You had, had Super Rugby Aotearoa where you were close. You've only really been to Australia to referee elsewhere. Has it been a major hit to your lifestyle and the way you're used to living? Yeah, it's been weird. Like, you know, all of a sudden I've uh, you know, no excuses for the lawn getting too long and, you know, like, you, you know, fix some DIY stuff around the house. Um, but I think, you know, normally we're away for, you know, 200 days of a year um, mm. because we actually, you know, we have to travel and because we've, we haven't been able to referee your own country, we never really have home games. So um, to, to go from, from that, um, you know, I was, before COVID hit, I was in, in Rome, then went to Cape Town and then the next week was in London and then we came back and that's when the borders closed. So since then I've been home. Where normally in that time I would have gone back to you know, Australia a few times, I would have gone to, you know, for a three or four week stint in South Africa, even Argentina. So you, you travel a lot. And then hopefully, you know, we get back to a bit more normality next year and, you know, get some really good super rugby, rugby happening. Oh yeah. Yeah, get Blues your airports victory, back what? Blues victory. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You're flying to Eden Park for a final by the sounds of it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> That's well, already you know, I've, I've, I've moved <laughs> on here now, so it's, it's fine. We'll um, be able to see what happens. <laughs> you have to get those air points back up. Oh, I'd no, imagine yeah. you're gold elite by a long way. Mate, that's I've definitely fallen by the wayside oh. now. You know, I've been writing emails saying, look, can I keep my gold elite? <laughs> oh, no, mate, you're going to pump down the cattle car yeah. out yeah. the back of the plane. Back so, to Jade. Yeah, I yeah, know. Jade, yeah, that's what it was. You'll yeah. be sitting in the lounge with the plebs using the vending machine yeah. soon. Yeah. yeah. You know yeah. what that is. Buying your own money. coffees. <laughs> It's tough life. <laughs> yeah, that's real tough. Do they, what do they do with you? Do they put you in business class? Do they chuck you in five-star hotels? Like, well, how sweet is the... Are, are you like the fish heads who are getting all the good stuff? We do get pretty good stuff. Like, you know, we're obviously athletes. As I think you have to, well. yeah. You know, we've got to, yeah. We, we do fly business class, so we're going up to the north. Um, luckily for me, you know, like, I, it means I can stretch out and sleep, but you definitely notice a difference because you land, you probably you arrive maybe on a Tuesday for a, a Saturday test match. So you, it normally takes about two or three days to yeah. acclimatise. So if you're stuck in cattle, um, you yeah, that, know, that, that's pretty tough. So they do look after us really well. Um, so fly us business class and, you know, we do get to, you know, stay in some pretty good hotels. Do you have GPS? Do you know how far? Because you'd run a bit in the game, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah. So we, um, we run about, I think, eight, eight to nine kilometres a game. That's which, good going, which, is, yeah. which is up there, but, you know, it's not, it's, it's different. It's a lot of, you know, start-stop stuff. And, yeah. um, you know, if we get tired, we can just, you know, blow a scrum, you know. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So it's pretty easy when you can control that. But. <laughs> you can just rely on players like me, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I'll I'll just knock, knock on. on. <laughs> Thanks, James. I need to knock on, please. Have you ever insisted on a reset just to get your breath back? Um, no. Uh, Normally the front <laughs> rows yeah. doing the resetting, mate. I guess the front rows, yeah. the referees, we're already, we've sort of got a little eye for yeah. each other, so we know. We'll just we reset that one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what kind of fitness do you do? Because you've obviously got to be sound of mind in the 79th minute like you are in the first. So you've got to be fit to make sure you're making those right decisions and you're not fatigued. Uh, what does your training week look like? Yeah, well, you nailed it. Like that's, you know, we don't have to be the, the, the biggest, the fittest, the strongest, the fastest. Like we've actually just got to have you know, a clear mind, you know, be fit enough to run, you know, get to that 7.5 Ks and still be able to make those game-defining decisions at the end because that's what we're um, remembered for. You know, and that's mm -hmm. how the game is. You know, we might make an error maybe in the first five minutes, but if we make that error in the last five, you know, that's when you have the headline. So, um, look, we do a lot of, so our midweek training is, you know, a lot of interval running, mm. um, so, you know, just trying to replicate the game. So, you know, we do like the Bronco test that a lot of players do. Um, what do you get? Um, I like to say I was sub 4.30, but most of the referees can go 4.40. Struth! What did Bodie get? Uh, he got 4.12 or 4.11. Yeah, no, that's, oh. that's, that's yeah. rapid. Um, so we, we can definitely do the running, but we, so we do a lot of that. Um, you know, the gym work isn't to get big, you know, we're not trying to be massive, but it's just injury prevention, you know, so we do have a trainer and, you know, they'll, they'll give us things to do every day leading, leading into a game. Mm. Uh, we've got to make sure the body's right for the, for the match and then, and then recover um, well as well. Um, you know, it's all important so that we can actually go out and put a good performance on. Obviously, you know, keep up with play as well so we can, you know, be at the tackle to make a right decision. Um, but we don't have to stay on side, so we can mm -hmm. run sort of those lines that, you know, we're out of the way and, um, yeah, that's something you do have to learn over time as well. Like is that hard run. without not getting in that passing channel, especially when you're trying to ref the breakdown and then, you know, you, then players naturally will look where the ref is because that potentially could be a weak point in the defence. <laughs> well, do you know what, like, I've actually, I've always, I've always thought, you know, players should run at us more. You, know? you should do a little bit of work on the referee and where they stand. Yeah. Because there's a few of us that I think that, you know, run a pretty good blocking line. Especially in around that heart area or that, uh, like, around the breakdown Five metres out from the goal line you yeah. go through because I think in law, you know, if you, if you don't touch the referee, actually, we had that a few years ago with, um, 
I think the All Blacks scored a try where um, one of the players was, players was blocked into Needham. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it is under law. So maybe that's something. We oh see mate, I always panic as a as a <laughs> defender when the refs like around me because all I think is if I was someone yeah. seeing that I'm trying to get out of the way of the ref, I'm like, oh, move, you're in my way, you're in my way, you're in my way. Well, that's the thing, I'm sure you've yelled at me heaps of times. Yeah. Like, um, so we, we normally, we do do a lot of work on our positioning, so, but now hope, hopefully it's kind of subconscious, like you get into a, yeah. you're watching the um, you're watching the tackle, but you get into like a, um, just in front of the D-line position yeah. so you can move in. Yeah. So yeah, constantly players are like, hey, get out of my way, get out of my way, and I'm, and I'm saying, yeah, I will, you know, like just give me half a second, half a second you're out of the way, but you know, you're right, like as a player, I guess you want to have like full peripheral, you want to see a view of everyone coming at you, not just the ball, so. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of work around that, and certainly, you know, position, position wise. Um, and, you know, we had to adjust this year because there seemed to be a lot of moves around the back of the line out now. Mm. Um, and often we stand at the back of the line. You know, you're probably sick of yeah. watching us at the back of the line, that's where we stand. And with those moves, you know, often we would get caught there. So as long as you we call it straight, adjust. I'm fine, mate. Oh, yeah, <laughs> darts real yeah, straight, don't you? Beautiful, <laughs> mate. Fine. Beautiful. Never had an issue with your throwing. Yeah. <laughs> um, just going to game day itself. Like, I'm always interested, do you guys keep track of like penalty counts or what sort of penalties or at, and or at half time? Is there like a coach that would say, oh, this is what's trending or these are things you're missing or do you just go as a group? Just, just as a group mainly. Like yeah. We have to, um, so we don't have our coaches, at, we, we have coaches, but we don't yeah. have coaches at the ground and we have yeah. to have our cell phones obviously have to be off so we can't get any messages from, yeah. from coaches. Mm-hmm. Um, so a lot of referees, yeah, we do keep penalty counts, yeah. uh, just mainly in our head or mm-hmm. we get our TMO to tell us. And that's really not about, it's not referring to a certain amount of penalties, but it's okay, out of those penalties, how many of them are down inside the 22? Yeah. How many of them are for killing the ball, you know, not rolling, going off feet, you know, those negative penalties? Mm. So we'll discuss that at half time because we, we want to make sure that, you know, if there are trends in the game, um, that we're not missing them. So, for example, if every time, um, you know, a team gets down to the 22, are they intentionally killing the ball? Or is that when all of a sudden we've got four or five penalties? Do mm. we need to therefore start talking to the captain, do we need to start escalating? You know, often that's why we'll pull you out and say, look, mate, there's too many down here, the next one might be a yellow card. Yeah. So those are all the discussions that if we haven't had that in the first 40 minutes, we haven't picked that up as a team, we'll have that at half time. So we'll talk yeah. about trends at the scrum, trends at the line out, trends at the tackle, how are we doing? And often it's, you know, if it's, if it's yep, keep, doing, keep, keep that standard, keep going well, then, you know, that will we'll take into the next 40 minutes. But often sometimes at half time, you know, that, and that's why it's great having guys that you trust and guys you worked with. You know, they'll say, look, Ben, for example, um, your scrum call is just a bit too quick. You know that's why we're getting a lot of cr- collapsed scrums. The collapsed scrums aren't because of the players; it's actually because your crouch behind set is too fast. Mm-hmm. So the, the players actually can't get you know good stability. Just on that, putting your hands up, I felt like during Super Rugby Aotearoa there was like a genuine collaboration between like I'd say coaching staff yeah. of teams, players, and the referees, and it felt like everyone. I don't know. Did you feel there was a difference there in that, oh, that collaboration and? I think it was the, the understanding big, each other. Yeah, that, I mean that was massive for us. I feel like you know we traditionally we always have one meeting at the start of the year with coaches yeah. and referees, and we all agree and we go, yeah, it's great. And then as we go throughout the competition, we sort of veer off. Um, but the beauty of having, I guess, the, the the sole New Zealand competition this year, there was a massive buy-in from from mm. coaches, and I think probably players as well. Um, so the coaches consistently kept in contact with us around what they were seeing in terms of the game because you know we told them it's like guys we're, we're the servants you know we're, we're the messengers tell us how you want us to referee it and we'll referee it for mm. you like that um, so you know there were, there were um, you know obviously all the Super Rugby coaches contacted us during the week and we had meetings throughout the season about how the game was going what they were seeing and you know what they thought about you know the picture of like the Jackler for example mm. you know we were getting it right we were not getting it right and it was, the beauty about that is like we, when we sit in our referee groups, we talk about it technically from the law book. Um, and we often lose, unless we had someone like you know, Glenn Jackson in the room, we, we lost that player or that coach's perspective or understanding, okay, this is what a team's trying to achieve. So mm. that understanding for us is really key because you know, we're trying to you know, referee the game, um, you know, for, for, obviously for the law, but or no, for the game and the players as well so they yeah. can actually play a good game of rugby. So that was a massive change this year, you're right. Mm. Um, and I think you know, we... We feed back after every game to the coaches around you know, key decisions that we made in the game that were right, but also ones that were wrong as well. So on Monday when you guys had your training sessions, um, you, know, you didn't have to you know, retrain things from an error that we made. You yeah, know, we yeah. could just put our hands up and say, look guys, yeah, we got that wrong. What you did there was, cro- was right, so yeah, don't worry about it, you know, we're sorry. But I also felt um, on the flip side for us at training, there was a harder standard because the coaches knew exactly what yeah. areas you guys were confident in nailing. 
we, we couldn't get away with it yeah. at training, you know, like it was, trainings were just as ruthless as a game, you know, in terms of, you know, we had Tana as our ref and he was Offside, blowing the it? whistle and, you know, but it prepared you to be able to, I suppose, handle it better as a player for the weekend, but also a greater understanding and appreciation of, you know, so from a refereeing role and, and how many things you've got to look at yep. um, is, is massively challenging. Yeah, I'd love to get that alignment, eh? Like, it, it, it showed that once you get that, you get a great competition. And I think having Tana at referee would be um, pretty good oh, as well. <laughs> you, you don't argue with him. No, no, no he's, he's yelled at us a few yeah. times. It's been interesting. I'd imagine you wouldn't want to mic him up if you were to put him on a television <laughs> refereeing. Uh, <laughs> not, with, not, not when I'm trying to creep a little bit offside to get you know get the run of play, but no, no, he's Do guys good. try he's and awesome. be offside, or are they just always trying no, to... No, you just gotta, you got to win the... Yeah. You, there's such a split second, you know, like the way... We review is like you, you don't want to be caught that one player, you know, back yeah. and and I think with those new rules, um, you know, uh, in Super Rugby Aotearoa, it took a while for defences to get used to just yeah. having that that greater step. But I think I thought that was a really good adjustment in, in the game. Yeah, it, it was it was amazing allowing like, that, that space. Play. Yeah, um, I think you know I remember being the assistant referee in one game. I remember just looking down the, the back feet and there was a, there was pretty much a gap there. Like a metre by the end of it. Yeah, so I'm like, I got amazing. my flag away, you know, I'm done. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was, it was incredible. And, and then you saw some of the games we got, it was, it was, it was really oh. good. And then, and then when you get that line speed, you realise that actually these guys are starting in the right position, their line speed's good. Um, so, you know, if they make a good, really good chop tackle, then, you know, it's, it's great defence. So yeah. it's awesome to see. How much detail do you go in when you prepare for a game like that? Like if you see, for instance, that Argentina's not committing anyone to the rucks and so they're likely to have a, you know, a pretty solid defensive line, how, how much do you scout teams the way that teams scout each other? Um, look, we do, we do, like, a part of my preparation would be to watch both teams, you know, the, the week before, you know, a few of their games and then all their, you know, their set piece stuff, their set piece stuff like the line out and the scrums. Um, and, and that's not to get, a, like, any preconceived ideas about teams or players because... You know, you're watching the Blues play last week, or um, well, they're playing a different team this week, you know, mm. so it could be totally different um, how they play in terms of um, what they do. I, the main thing I look for is, is, you know, trends or things that, you know, they do at line out or trends they do um, within the game that, that might catch me by surprise. I think as a referee, if you're caught by surprise by a certain move, um, then you're, you're more likely to make an error. Mm. But I also want to make sure that, look, if, you, if you're a team that does a lot of moves at the back of the line out, for example, you know, maybe I'll adjust my position and be at the front of the line out more in terms of my setup. Um, so leading into a game, that's the kind of stuff that I'll look at. Okay, where can I be positionally to, to be in the right position to actually make um, the, these kind of calls? Um, the only time where it comes down to an actual team is, I remember a few years ago, I think Italy did the no ruck tactic mm. that you were talking about. Yeah. And so they nearly really they nearly beat England in a, in a Six Nations game, you know. Like, um, and I remember I think the referee was Roman Poit, and it might have been James Haskell or Dylan Hartley. You know, asked him like, "What do we do?" And, and Roman Poit, in his French accent, said, "Look, I'm not your coach." And that was just what happened in the, in the middle of the game. And so I refereed the next weekend, um, Italy versus France. So I knew that Italy were potentially going to do the same thing again. So, you know, I did a lot of pre work watching them and and when they did it, and you know, got in touch with their coaches to make sure that look, this is technically how you need to do it if you want to do it correctly. So there's a lot of work going into that game in terms of how I planned. Um, and then, you know, we, we came out and we did the game. And I think they did it once or twice. So, you know, there's no, no massive issue. So um, it, it's just really around, you know, new things that a team that a team might employ. Because um, otherwise, you know, as a referee, we, we understand our philosophies around how I referee the scrum, the tackle. I'm going to do the same thing no matter what. And that's why I think it was, you know, it was a lot easier refereeing your own country because actually you're just out there refereeing the same pictures that you would normally referee mm. if it was a super rugby game or another, another test match anyway. Do you carry the law book with you? You know, do you go to bed and read a chapter each Mate, there's law books in my head, you know, <laughs> so um, that's what we tell any captain if they ask. But um, <laughs> yeah. we, we do, we have to understand the law a lot. Um, you know, we have to do, there's a law exam that you have to do at the start of every year and you've got to, you know, obviously you've got to pass that. Um, but... There's a law, but then there's all these new interpretations that they bring out, and that's the big thing that, for example, this year, you know, we had to, um, you know, the law book's about that thick, but you probably only use about that much in a game of rugby. Mm. If, we, if, I, if I wanted to use, if we wanted to use the law book in every every game as it was written, there'd be 50, 60 penalties, and, you know, no one would actually get the ball in hand as soon yeah. as people went off their feet the ruck. Um, you know, you'd, you'd blow a penalty, and that's the problem is, you know, there's, you know, the, the interpretation and what you see and what you miss is, you know, that's the, that's the, we can get, you know, errors and consistency between referees potentially. Um, so, yeah, for this year, and you guys would have had to deal with it playing, you know, there's a lot of interpretation um, that we had to try and, you know, get on in terms of the jackler, in terms of, you know, players cleaning coming in from the side, cleaning out. out. 
I think I, I penalised you Chiefs, in the first yeah. game. Yeah, the Chiefs, yeah, we can talk about that now where, <laughs> man, you blew up and then I was like, no, nah, man, I've, I've nailed that. You know, I, actually, I actually thought I'd nailed that decision. And well, the frustration on the faces well, of the players. Because he needs to, you don't need to dive on him. But the message just keeps getting repeated, stay on your feet. And then, because um, I was right behind you when you did that. <laughs> And then I, I watched on... Bloody good cleaner. It was, a, it was a bloody good cleaner on review. I looked at that and you got the arm under the player. I was like, oh, Sam, that's going in the email to the coaches. You know. Yeah, Tom um, did come up to me and he did said... Because I was spewing, as you can imagine. Yeah. Because, um, like, Tom's... You know, if you give away a penalty, it's quite yeah. a big thing for you as a person as playing in a review. Yeah. You know, he calls them daps, dumbass penalties. And, and it's like, <laughs> if you have one of them, it's like a real big black mark against your name. So there's a lot of players out there going, oh, I don't want a dap, you know, yeah. and that's all I was thinking then. Is I didn't know either. Like, I was like, oh, it's a good clean, but because of the interpretation of the law, it was a bit grey. Yeah, yeah. And, and I started, you know, I was like, oh, man. I've done, and I said to him after the game, I was like, oh, I did that dumb penalty. But then he came up and said that you had my back, so cheers. That, that, that was my dad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's the thing, eh? Like, and, you know, it took us a few weeks as referees and I think players, you know, all of us to sort of adjust and then meet in that happy medium around, yeah. you know, what we were seeing because... Do you reckon it got there in the end? Yeah, I think we got really close. Yeah. I think especially with the Jackler picture, I reckon, because in round one, if you remember, man, like if you put a fingertip on the yeah, ball, you got a mate, penalty. penalty, it's like, yeah. you know, um, we had about 35 penalties in the game. And then, you know, two weeks later, you, you went back to the old school, sort of two hands on the ball, you're tugging and then you still didn't get rewarded. So, you know, we seesawed a little bit, um, but as players adapted and as we adapted, I think we did find that happy medium. And, you know, a lot of countries around the world who was watching the, the, the rugby down here, um, the referees got a bit of a head start because of you know we were actually mm. telling them okay we went through that process, these are the, go the this, this is the gold standard that you need um, and this is how you should be looking at it in terms of your pictures. How did that play out for you guys? Because my memory was you know it was getting hammered at the start and by the end it wasn't getting hammered. The conversations behind closed doors were they like hey let's loosen off guys or you know let's continue with the same consistency because people always just say be consistent that's all we want. Like how do you play that out as a referee talking to other referees talking to your bosses? and coaches and players now behind closed doors to make sure that the evolution isn't seen as inconsistency. Yeah, it's, it's tough. Like, it was, it was, you know, we came in really, really hard, but we, we, we just, like that first round, but we weren't sure about how hard, like, what hard was, you know, because we were trying to still understand about the, what is the picture that we must penalise. Um, so I think by the end of the season, I think that's why we did kind of get there. Um, we, we, we keep getting told by coaches, like, just keep going hard at it because, like, Often, I think in years have gone by, you know, we've done it for about a few rounds and then we've, we've relaxed and then, you know, so coaches and players were potentially waiting for us to just relax again. But, you know, they were telling us, keep going hard, we're going to adapt, we're going to adapt. And then I think after about, about around, you know, four or five, um, you know, the, we, we stayed at sort of that, that understanding, but, you know, we got a sort of a bit more, more accurate in what we we're trying to mm -hmm. do. And then the players continued their consistency around it and we got that happy medium where, you know, we weren't giving um, as many penalties at the end of the competition because players were better at it. And so therefore it made our job easier. Like we didn't need to penalise a lot. They understood what they were um, trying to achieve and we actually understood the decision that we were giving. So that's why I reckon that um, it, it got really good by the end of the season. And um, you know, we saw, you know, we landed the Midas 10 Cup and I think the, the referees below, the professional referees, were able to see that. We were able to like give our learnings to them. And then, you know, they were able to sort of hit the ground running um, in the, in the Midas 10 Cup comp. Do you mentor those guys? Like, how, how does that work as far as the development of referees? We hear a lot about the development of players, but with refs, does it work that way? Yeah, this, this year was great. I mean, Zoom and you know, online video like conferencing opened our, our eyes to be able to like, you know, just be able to talk like you know, sort of weekly or fortnightly. So we often had a lot of, um, a lot of meetings around how the game was going and you know, the, the trends that we were seeing. Um, and you know there is a good group of, of, of referees within New Zealand. You know we're, we're all pretty tight. That you know if they've got questions, you either get you, you often get an email or a phone call about um, someone about their game, or they might watch something that you did in the weekend. Um, and you know they might you know, ask you a few questions on Monday about you know like was that a penalty against James Parsons? And you know you'd say no, nah, mate, that one, that one wasn't. And he goes good. I didn't think that was either. So <laughs> um, the, even the younger guys are we're, we're thinking you know so. There's, um, there's a lot of good collaboration, I think, in, in New Zealand rugby, especially, especially with the referees uh, across all the competitions, you know, male, female, um, sevens and fifteens as well. So it's been really good. I remember I was in Japan a couple of years ago when there was a couple of All Blacks tests up there and we went down the road after the game and got on the piss. And three, <laughs> three referees turned up at that bar. It was Marius Yonker, Rasta 
and the other Marius, what's his surname? Marius van der Yeah, I'm, I'm they, probably going to tell you the three yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And they were there on the piss, and we ended up getting on the piss with them all night long. Probably Jaco Piper wasn't there as well. It was probably at a bar down the road. <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably. Um, and one of the things Marius Jonker said to me was that there are some brutal WhatsApp groups where the refs are just paying each other out. Is, is there a little bit of that going yeah, on? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you got to you got to have a bit. Of, you got to be able to laugh at yourself and have a bit of fun. Eh? Like, um, we we do. We got we got obviously groups that. Um, you know, to keep in touch, you know, around games and decisions, you know, we keep in touch around, you know, what we saw or if we have to send videos out to each other, we, we do that. And um, obviously we, we especially had that at the World Cup in Japan. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of banter. Right? Like, they're just decent guys as well. You know, a lot of the um, English referees, they, they, they bring in a lot of humour as well. Um, so you do. And I think if you can't laugh at yourself, you know, then you're not in the right, you're not in the right game. Um, so, you know, you, you might make an error in a game. Like I got a lot of stuff for that, 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 that Fiji and Australian game that I did at the start of the, the World Cup, and um, you know they, I got a bit of stick for that, and you just got to, you got to smile at it. You know it's happened, and you move on because you know you be able to get your other, the boys back. Um, you know later on with a few games after that. <laughs> the, the players must like that though. Those human touches, like I mean, the low five obviously got got a fair amount of coverage. But as far as you guys are concerned, having a little bit of a, a rapport and you know just an understanding that we're both human probably makes a big difference to the way you relate to the ref. I think it's massive. I think, and and you spoke about I think it was Angus Gardner and the, that player management. I think it's crucial to not get, you know, one, to let the game flow, but also there's not too much of a conversation in the middle of the game. You know, it's, you understand where the rest came from, you understand where the captain's coming from, and it's sort of short and sharp. Uh, if, if you don't have that, how, how can you, you know, trust each other? Because you've still got to yeah. trust the process. Mm. You've got to trust the ref. Yes, you'll challenge it, and yes, you'll pose the question. Yeah. But once the question's answered, you've got to, you've got to move away and, and, and go. And I think having that ability to connect um, you know, before and after the game, and, and making sure that that relationship's right is crucial. Yeah, and that's one of the, for me, like that. I see that as one of the biggest things in the game is that relationship between the captain. Because, look, my job out there is just to make a decision based on what I saw, and you know, I, I don't want a team to um, be negatively influenced from that. You know, for the rest of the game, I want to be able to actually give that message to the captain so that they can help. You know, the team. Like this is what I'm seeing. Deliver that to your team. And I think. You know, that, that two-way relationship is really important because, as you mm. said, you know, if the captain asks, you know, poses questions, um, you know, you've got some really smart captains now. They know the law, and, and, you know, nine times out of ten, they're right. And it's not that, you know, they might not be able to change that decision for you right then and there, but, you know, they can definitely plant the seed of, okay, how am I seeing those pictures, you know, for, for the rest of the game? And, you know, you know Nigel Owens, who's just announced his retirement, I think he's, he's just one of the best. He's What you see of him on the field is how he is off the field. And mm. I think, you know, that's really important because the game happens so quickly. If you're not your natural self on the field, and you're trying to be someone else, you're trying to be what you think a referee should be like, and it's really tough, like A, when you get in the heat of the moment, but B, when you've got you know, a captain coming at you and challenging you or asking you questions about you know, decisions that you're making. Because mm. there's one instance, um, and we spoke about it on here, with, I think it was Michael Hooper, um, it might have been to Paul Williams, and uh, there was a number of penalties, and I think it was against Argentina, and he, he, he goes, oh, mate, you know, we need reward for that, challenged him. And I think Paul was like, okay, mate, yeah, this is what I've done for it. This is what I've seen. And then he went again. He goes, no, I've given you my answer and walked off. And I thought that was quite good because it was just really succinct. And it was like, okay, Michael's trying to challenge for his country, yep. which is great. But it actually, no, I've given you my answer now. And now we've got to move on, which is which I yeah, thought look, was quite strong and powerful. I don't know if you remember that. And I do remember that. So that was out... Um uh, yeah, that was the the Argentina game. Yeah, um, Argentina Australia, and um, it was in it was in Newcastle. And it was a really good example of just how to how to manage a captain. You know, like a captains doing their job, mm. um, but as as a, as a referee as well, you know, you got to you got to respect that, um, but give the information to to the captain. So, I think you know some referees or, or you know you know a wee while ago, you know, often a referee might even just say, no, I'm not going to talk to you now. Yeah. Um, but if it's the right moment to be able to talk to you, then yeah, you should have that relationship. You should have that communication with the captain because. Generally, Michael Hooper is probably just asking. He's like, "Mate, look, is this is this enough penalties down here? Or what do we need to do to change?" So he can feed that to you know feed that to his team. His coach is probably in his ear about you know asking the referee as well. So um, it, it's important. It's an important part of the game, and I think you know the respect that is there between players, captains, and, and referees at the moment is is excellent. Mm. Um, you know, all you need to do is go and watch football and you know see that yeah. you know, how they do it. Like. There's no talking between players and referees, um, so you know it must be really difficult for for players to actually understand what's going on, and even for for referees to get that buy-in. You know, so you know we, we're really privileged in, in the game that we're involved in. What's the professional boundary? Like, are there players that you're mates with off the field? I think like um, one thing that we got to remember is that 
you know, you're always a player, I think, in the public spotlight. And I think you're always a referee as well, especially when you're doing test matches and, um, and games. So, you know, there's certainly guys that I grew up with who, you know, playing Super Rugby, playing Mighty Ten Cup. And I guess over time, as you referee for long enough, you get to know guys, you know. Um, so you never be rude, like, it's always a hello, but like, you wouldn't, um, you wouldn't be seen going out with them after the game. Um, you know, you probably wouldn't be seen before the game with them as well, unless you're doing like a meeting with, with the coach. Um, so you always have to be switched on, um, mm. especially you know in those environments, you know around World Cups, around Test matches. Um, it, it doesn't mean to say not like we don't go out and have fun, you know, within our own referees. But actually, that's probably my team now, you know. So you spend more time with your mm. friends and, and that. Um, so you know, you enjoy your time with them after a game. Um, so yeah, there's definitely you know, professional boundaries um, that you got to keep keep up with. Um, we mentioned before we, we touched on it the, the referee TMO AR interaction and the relationship between the three of them um, and I suppose one of the things that was a big talking point this year was where one's job starts and the other one finishes yep. when you, you, you mentioned Dane Coles you know and, and you I think you awarded that a try or said I'm happy with the grounding and then upstairs said actually let's have a bit of a look is it the, is it the right balance do you think using the entire team as a team so you know as the ref your call is just a guideline almost to, to the decision yeah, look, I, th I think it's. I think we're going in the right direction. Um, you know, like there's so much technology available now, like camera angles, replays, and like the speed of decision that we can get from one one angle um, is generally pretty quick. So, you know, often people often we get criticised for using the TMO too much, and I think um, that argument was correct a few years ago when we had a lot of TMOs coming in to check potential foul play um, that was happening in the field, and like we then look at it on the big screen, and it's really a nothing. You know, like you know, there's marginal high contact. Um, it's really just to play on but we've stopped the game for three minutes. I think when that happened maybe once or twice in a game throughout Super Rugby, that's when people started you know, blowing up. Um, but you know, they'll, they'll also blow up as well if we, you know, there was a, a try in the corner and we, we awarded it, um, but you know, actually there was a foot out in touch or you know, something like that. So um, we've got to get that fine balance of you know, when we use the TMO to actually get the right decision. Like we, we, we don't want to negatively influence the game as referees by making the wrong decision on the field, especially when a replay shows that we can be right. So. Uh, I think um, yeah, we're going in the right direction because now we've actually got um, referees who are going to be are in the TMO box. So mm -hmm. traditionally we had you know, TMOs, but now, for example, we rotated in Tri-Nations. We've actually got a professional referee who's been in all those meetings, who understands foul play, who understands the game, to be able to make those decisions. Mm -hmm. So the way we might be able to shorten that up is that beforehand, it would only be for foul play. It would go upstairs, um, the TMO would show us the angles, and then you know, we would make the decision on the field because we're the referee. Sometimes that was hard because we're looking, you know, 50 metres away at a, mm. a screen about the size of mm. um, that. So that was always difficult. But now, because we've got referees, so because I might be in the, in the TMO box now, there's no reason why that, you know, I couldn't just make the decision for the guy in the middle of the field. Um, we look at we look at one angle. Like, yep, that's that's play on. Yep, that's yellow card. And then we get on with it. And that might speed the game up a, game up a bit more. How does sitting in the TMO box change the way that you ref on the field? Does it give you a slightly different perspective? Yeah, it's given me a huge understanding for, you know, the difficulty that, that they have, you know, like um, sitting in the TMO box, you know, because I did, I TMO'd the um, New Zealand-Argentina game for the first time. So I sat on the sideline in Super Rugby to, to do it, but then now I was up in the box, you know, with you know, all the different angles and you're sort of going back and forth. And it's a real fine art around how much detail you actually go into. Um, because, you know, if you, if you slow mode and freeze frame <laughs> every tackle, every ruck, you could find something. So you really just want to make, you know, get that big picture. And I think that's the benefit of having a referee in the TMO box is that actually, you know, we do understand that big picture stuff because we have to referee that on the field. So now I've got the benefit of being able to do a you know, cheeky little replay. Um, yeah, that's pretty good, you know, like I'd love to do that live. So, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, having my mate doing that now for me who's a, um, you know, like a Paul Williams or a, an Angus Gardner, I think is, um, you know, are really good for the game. So I think we'll be able to speed it up and, um, you know, with that teamwork, I think um, it's going to help, uh, help the game out big time. From a player's point of view, is that the way you'd like to see it? Yeah, I think, look, um, from a player's point of view, I suppose you just want the right decision. Yeah. And especially when the game's on the line, like, um, you know, for a try or, or, a, or a yellow card, that can be quite beneficial. Um, so you want the right decision. But I can also understand it from a fan's point of view in terms of that time. Uh, when you look at the pressure, I suppose, if I reference the NRL, uh, of, of this, um, they call it the bunker, and how quick they've been demanded to do it. And sometimes it still doesn't. They're still talking about it on a Monday. Do you know what I mean? So because I think speed. I think it's a yeah. fine balance between, yeah. ru well, not rushing it, but getting it done at a at a pace like the NRL are trying to do to to where we're at at the moment. Um, and I I do think I agree that now you've got the referee up in the TMO, mm. um, the the connection you clearly have as a group as a team. 
um, and that trust so that the, the I think if you hear say Angus Gardner go nah mate that's yellow you, you, you'll straight away won't even need to see it yeah. you'll be like right nah it's yellow come here gone you know and that just speeds it up so I think that from a playing point of view is the way forward that group that group of four working together and staying together um, yeah because I mean because then I know like if, if he's saying it should be a yellow card I know I know that because what we've, the work we've done during the week in the last four weeks um, I know that his yellow card is the same as my yellow card yeah. if I was looking at the mm. same screen. Um, so I think, yeah, you're right, that's definitely going to speed things up. But also from a player's point of view, you know, you probably already know it's a yellow card because what you saw of that team working together two weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. So and that, that's where I just think that consistency creates a lot of trust from player to ref. Yeah. And you know what's coming, so nothing surprises. Just like you don't want to be surprised by a line-out move or something, we don't want to be surprised by a decision. Yeah. You know, and, and understanding ref's trends is something that we look at as well. And I suppose if you're looking upstairs and it's not a nameless, faceless guy in the TMO box, it's a bloke that you deal with all the time. It gives you a certain feeling that there is a responsibility to you as well as the laws from that person because you already have that relationship. Well, that's, that's what, um, so in the New Zealand-Argentina game, um, that's what Angus Gardner said to Pablo Mateta. He was like, um, oh, don't worry, mate, we've got Ben O'Keefe up in the TMO box. And yeah. <laughs> luckily, Pablo was like, oh, yeah, cool, thanks. Yeah. It could have backfired on me big time. Yeah, but yeah. I think you're right, you know, like... Yeah. Um, yeah, you can put a face to it, but you also know that okay, that's you know that's that's a referee. Um, you know, he's, he knows the laws of the game. Actually, knows you know referring at at this level. So I think it definitely helps. And you know, it's something that the you know the NRL like they probably lead the way in terms of um, getting that bunker um, you know organised to be able to make those quick decisions. Mm. Um, and they've you know they've sort of done a, some good work in sort of that refereeing space. Did you like what they did with two NRL referees? Yeah, I think for NRL, like I think for NRL, it was it was really good. Um, there's been a lot of talk around getting two referees in in, in rugby union. Um, I'm not sure, so sure how much, how well that would work um, the way that it is right now. I think there's a few steps that we should do before that happens. Because um, I think with NRL, you know, like um, a lot of that came, having two having two referees came out of you know making sure there's someone on the D line, there's someone also on the attack as well. So it made yeah. sense that they weren't having to cross over all the time. And because they back ten meters, is exactly. quite a big. Uh, area yeah. of grass that where you guys can stand and one guy's yeah. on the ruck, it's, it is. So different. you're having to cross over quite a lot. Um, whereas in rugby, you know, there's, there's still a lot of interpretation um, that happens in a game, mm. um, especially at the tackle. Now, look, we're, we're trying to get that, con that consistency, consistency gap to be a lot smaller between referees, and I think by working together more, we will see that consistency. But um, I think, um, you know, it'd be really difficult if you had two referees referring the breakdown. Um, my slight interpretation on um, how much of an effect a tackler has had on arriving players not rolling um, and allowing a jack on the ball might be slightly different to a Paul Williams mm. um, if he was refereeing the same game. So I think players would really dislike you know, me giving a penalty on the halfway and then not being a penalty inside the 22 yeah. just because there's another referee mm. there. So um, I think it's a discussion to have in the future because already we've already got, as I've said, you know, two referees who are assistant referees on the sideline. So I might be the assistant referee, Paul Williams might be the assistant referee, and Brendan Pickerel uh, might be the referee. So what we actually need to do is instead of just us guys on the sideline, you know, focusing on you know offsides, or actually we probably need to, you know, we first need to get a lot better at um, you know uh, w working on offsides like kick chase and um, you know ruck offsides first. And like once we if we could do that, um, and we can you know offer more input to the referees on the middle of the field, then I think that's going to actually help. And it'll probably take away the need for those those two referees because mm. um, I think a lot of the argument around two referees is, is so the you know the game's so quick so the referee's missing you know potentially some decisions. Well, you know a few years ago it used to be just the referee did everything on the field. Mm. Now we're encouraging. Look, you got the two guys on the sideline, have as much input as you can, communicate. You know we're all we're all mic'd up, um, so you know feed 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 in everything that you're saying so that we can actually make better decisions for the game. So we already have three referees on the field. Mm. Uh, we just really need to open up the, the floodgates in terms of you know what they can rule on. How constant is that chatter? Like if I'm sitting here in this chair, I could be talking to you and getting a director's um, message in my ear at the same time. Yep. You know, is that what it's like for you? You're thinking, talking, hearing, all of those things are happening all at once while you're trying to make your decisions? Um, yeah, so it's like for me personally, like I like that because and I tell my assistant referees and my TMO, I say, guys, I want to know what you're thinking constantly every every single moment of the game so that contextually I know exactly what's going on um, you know big picture I, I want to know what the team is thinking at downtime you know because you know you're seeing it from the TV angle and I also want to know you know from my system referees you know how are you finding space what is the scrum like on your side um, so it doesn't it doesn't necessarily happen live um, but certainly during you know the front of the line out time off um, after tries you know I'm always talking always asking my ARs to, to feedback that information because you know again like I trust the guys on the sideline um, they'll be seeing things slightly different to me 
um, and I'd rather them tell me that I'm making a, an incorrect, I'm seeing incorrect pictures or actually yes space is really good so I'd rather know that so then I can you know, put my focus elsewhere. Um, so I think you know, there's a lot of chatter, I think um, we're encouraging more chatter, it used to be pretty quiet and um, you know, potentially you know, if you're listening to us on the sideline, um, you, know, you might even you know, take the earpiece out. You know, I'd love for that to happen because it means we're actually communicating a lot um, and you know, giving that feedback so that we can you know, make right decisions. Mm. So how long does a referee go for? Like, what, do you, what is the length of a professional referee's career now? Well, it's, I mean, it's, it changes, you know, like it could be, it could be one game, um, it could be one year, it could be as Nigel Owens, Nigel Owens is 49, so mm. he's just retired. Um, from international it's games, impressive after. when you think of it. Yeah. It's 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 unbelievably impressive. Like, and I, and I don't think I didn't realise how impressive it was until until you realise how hard it is actually to get to test match level. Mm. Um, like, you got to work really hard. You got to get jump through a lot of hoops. You got to get through a lot of games to get to that level, and then to actually stay at that level for the I think 19 years that he mm. did, or 18 years that he did. I think he went to three World Cups. Now, that, I think that's even harder. To actually, you know, to, to go through those big games where the whole world's watching, the whole world, the whole world's criticising every decision. So to continue on like that just shows the calibre of you know, those top guys that are, are doing those games um, internationally, you know, year after year after year. So, um, you know, like it, it, it's really limited only by your body. So Nigel Owens, you know, he's um, worked really hard to keep fit, injury free, and you know, he, he can still referee a test match really well. You know, he refereed one of the fastest test matches a few years ago, that All Black South Africa game. Um, and you know, apart from a bit of cramp in the last five minutes, he, he almost he, he pretty he, well, he got there. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So you can keep going, um, and it's uh, yeah, it's really just down to your performances. Are you still selected, and if your body stays stays up to it. So is that kind of form is it easy to keep up? You know, we we see players have got 10, 15 years, and they'll have their ups and downs. You know, where how they go as a ref, consistently being at that high caliber. I mean, do you see yourself as having form? Yeah, you do. Like, I mean, it, a lot of it is just up to the game, though, as well. You know, so a lot of the times, if the game goes well, um, you know, sometimes that reflects on the referee, referee too. Um, if it's a scrappy game, we're actually, you know, you referee a scrappy game really well. Um, sometimes, like, you, it just doesn't look like you refereed well. But you know, once you go into the review and the detail with your coaches and, and our um, and our assessors, you know, they actually they always look at the fine detail of the game and are we consistently getting things right? Was a foul play decision that we did last weekend, for example, the weekend before, were they correct? And if you're still ticking those boxes, um, you know, there is that review behind the scenes that is why someone like Nigel Owens, Wayne Barnes, Yako Piper, the French referees, you know, that's why they're at that top level. So um, despite from what you see from the, from the outside, um, you know, for them to stay there, they're actually continually getting mm. those decisions right. And, mm. and it, I think it gets easier the, 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 the more experienced you are. So you know, like technically they may not know or might, may not referee technically as well as probably someone just entering the the sort of the, the realms of, of test referring, but they've been through, you know, they've seen that breakdown decision before, they've mm. seen that foul play decision before, and they know what the right decision is based on experience. So with that experience, it just gets them through those top games, and you know, that's why I think, um, you know, Nigel Owens, he could probably, if his body kept up with it, he could probably referee for another five years. Some, someone like Wayne Barnes, you know, he'll referee the next World Cup. Um, and, but he, he's at a point now where his mistakes, like a player, his mistakes are, get smaller and smaller mm. and smaller, because, yeah. you know, he's done more and more, more games. And you know he's he's in a smart position where he's probably he's in that group of actually um, you know when we talk about law interpretations and law changing, he's part of the group that's making those decisions with players, coaches, um, and world rugby. So you know, he's probably doing it in a way that's going to help him out as well. You know, the benefit is referring. <laughs> Has that always been part of it that the refs have had a bit of input into the laws? Mate, no, to be honest, like it's it's surprising, but it hasn't it hasn't always been the case. It's only really been the last few years that. You know, we've got someone like a Wayne Barnes and a Yarko Piper who've, who've, who've put their hands up and said, look, we want to be part of this um, because we want to be able to referee what the players and the coaches want. But I think you know, it is good for the players and coaches to hear how that is possible. Like, okay, how would we do that in terms of doing that on the field? Um, I think, as you said, you know, like, um, when, you're, when you guys are, are training, you, you train to how we interpret decisions as well. So um, as long as, you know, if we can articulate that, then it's going to make it easier to coach and then easier to train and, mm. and implement on the field. Mm, long term, it makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Yeah, I, th I think so. I think for, it's better for the game if we can all just be in one big silo. Um, you know, we'll only have a small part of it as referees. Like, we don't want to be any bigger than we need to be. 
um, but I think it will definitely help, help the game. I suppose the thing is that you guys cop the impact of the laws, don't you? I mean, you only referee the laws that you're given, you don't make the laws. But in a lot of ways, you guys are the experts on the laws because you're the ones who have to infiltrate them week by week and have the best feeling for it. So the idea it took this long is kind of crazy. <laughs> it, is, it is, it is, it is a bit, but it's, um, it's just, I think it's the way that, that rugby's going, you know, it is, it is a professional sport now and, you know, people are trying to get it right for, you know, spectators and, and they want it implemented so that it, it happens quickly. Um, so, you know, we've got, um, you know, guys are involved now like Joe Smith, you know, they're, they're really into, you know, with their experience as a coach, you know, he, he's heading up high performance world rugby um, with, with coaches, with players, with referees. There's going to be a really good environment, I think, where we can actually get the game moving forward positively because it is, you know, we, we've got to try and market it against all these other, other sports mm. as well, you know. Yeah. So NRL has gone through changes, even cricket's gone through changes because, you know, there's only a small pot of money that is going to go to sport, you know, in the world. So. I think um, you know we, we, we do have to keep uh, moving forward with the game, and uh, you know if we bring in more changes next year and more interpretations, um, you know it should be to benefit the game so that you know people are going to watch it. How much of that you mentioned like the big part of the book that you don't use? Yeah. How much of that would you get rid of if you were put on that panel? You know, how much would you simplify the union in order to make it an easier watch and easier to understand and easier to attract those people who are on the periphery who watch the game and go, I don't really get that. Yeah, look, there'd be a lot of stuff that I think they've already tried to simplify. Um, this year, there was, it was about reinforcing the actual law, okay, because we probably got loose over the last few years. Mm. So making sure that the tackler does get out, make sure, making sure that players do enter through the gate and stay on their feet. You know, we sort of got quite loose over the last few years because, you know, at the expense of, you know, trying to get this flowing game of rugby. I think we can still get that um, if we, you know, if the referees sort of hold up the end of the bargain and penalise it and then, then the players can actually um, do what they, they want to do. Um, but, you know, there, there's... You know, probably over the next few years, there's going to be just additions to the law book to actually make the game better. Um, we, we, we saw last year, or this year, in Super Rugby Australia, they had the 40-22 law, um, they had the goal line dropout law, you know, so sort of moving closer to the league, mm. which you'd be pretty stoked about. Yeah, yes, <laughs> um, And then, you know, there could be, you know, future things like in other sports, you know, in, in our they've got captain's challenge. Yeah. Um, and cricket as well, you know, so um, is that something that we could bring in, um, you know, into rugby, you know, in the next few seasons to to stop potentially those you know, game-defining decisions, errors that referees can make you know, with two minutes to go. Um, but also, do you reckon it would cut out a lot of discussion? Because like watching the NRL with the captain's challenge, um, you know, like say Cam Smith or someone was saying something to the referee, he was like, challenge it then. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 I'm all right. You know, so <laughs> it, yeah. it actually gets rid of yeah. all the questioning because you've got the tool there if you want to use it. Yeah, to, I, think, to I think two ways as well, because then when Cam Smith um, you know, challenges the, um, the referee, and the referees found out to be right or wrong. Yeah. Well, no one's talking about the referee anymore. Everyone's yeah. just talking about, oh, that decision in the game was correct. Um, yeah, they got and they got it right. So I think you know, there's there's tools like that that can be put in place that's going to help the game. And if it's to be if it's to be to be able to get the right decisions, if it's to be to be able to speed the game up, then you know, there's, there's ways that we can to you know make the product, which is rugby, um, a lot more enjoyable to watch. That's the balance, isn't it? Really, speeding the game up and getting the decision right. Those two things don't necessarily go hand in hand. No, they don't, and that's, you know, if we go back to like the TMO discussion at the start, um, we've got to find a way where we can get those TMO decisions quick and, and right so that we can actually, I think, you know, if, if we're just looking at, at speed of the game just for, for the expense of a decision, well, I don't think people, people don't argue about the game being too long more than they would about mm -hmm. um, decisions being wrong and a team losing a game because of a, a wrong decision that we could have checked, you know, it could have taken 15 seconds and then we would have been right. Um, so yeah, there's that, there's that balance that, you know, there's a lot of guys who get paid a lot more than I, I do to, you know, to come up with, really. <laughs> get on top of that pay grade. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So those are things that maybe could happen for next year, the year after, whatever. What happens for you now during the pre-season? The, the players obviously go away and train and they spend a couple of months. I think we're not back till February 26th? Yeah, yeah, late, yeah. Late well, we're February. back in early Jan. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So games start at February 26th. What do you do now to prepare over the next two months? Look, I'll, I'll definitely be having a few weeks off. Um, just because you know it's been a long year, it's been a, a difficult year for everyone. So, um, probably like the players, we have a few weeks off, enjoy Christmas, New Year's, you know, home with with friends and family, and then, and then yeah, it's amazing. You know, then we get straight back into it. You know, the whole year just starts again. Like no longer is rugby just a winter sport. Um, so we'll we'll get together as a, a group of professional referees for pre-season in Jan. Um, a lot of that will be you know we'll, we'll get together in Wellington um, and. Um, you know, go over, okay, how are we going to how are we gonna hit the ground running from what we learnt last year um, to any new interpretations this year and just start, like, um, really just putting, you know, brainstorming okay, how we're going to start the season. So we'll still train over, over the summer period, 
Um, you won't be doing as many Broncos as we probably did this year, <laughs> but it'll just be you know, getting out, you know, some maybe longer distance runs, you know, going to the gym, just keeping that fitness up so that we can, you know, hit, hit pre-season and, and, and be ready to go. Because I think there's pre-season games sort of mid-February yeah, it's, um, all around the place. So, yeah, we're back into quick. it in about five weeks. And then depending how the year goes, you know, we'll be talking this time next year and we will, you know, we've only just stopped the week before. So, you know, it could be, be the, the whole season again. Yeah, yeah. And your fitness levels, who's the benchmark that you've got to meet with fitness levels in New Zealand? Who's the, the oh, number one fittest, fastest athlete ref? It's, it's Paul, Mr. Fitness Williams. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, he's pretty good. He's, he, he's like a little whippet. He sort of can get around the, around the field pretty quick. Um, James Dolman as well. Um, he spends a lot of a lot of time sort of more on the upper body, um, but he can he can still get around pretty pretty quick as well. You don't need guns as a referee. No, no. I, well, well, I, 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 you know, you got to you got to make sure you know. You oh, you do. You know, you get a bit of yeah. bit of TV time, but no, I've, I've got them past those times now. So. I'll just be the older guy that will just cruise down with the boys and um, yeah, it'll be fine. You don't want to be the Bill Harrigan, Steve Walsh ref uh, sex symbol. No, no, no. We'll leave that to some of the younger boys coming through, maybe. <laughs> well, on that note, thank you very much for joining us today, Ben. And uh, once again, Jibber, it's Cheers, been a good mate. year. Oh, it's been great. It's been a good year. And we'll be back next year. So hopefully you'll be back with us with the Aotearoa Rugby Pod beginning just before the season kicks off at late February.